Okay. Um, I'm actually, I was, you know, a few weeks ago, I shared with you folks that I was out at a conference in Las Vegas for, um, for the Slack group. We had a lot of updates, a lot of training just during that jam-packed uh, two and a half days, I guess it was, or um, just about two days. And I'm actually heading to another conference tomorrow morning, early tomorrow morning. Uh, you know, I, uh, I love the material that is presented, but I just, I'm not a fan of the traveling, especially when I'm not able to bring my family. So I'll be out of the office uh, tomorrow, Thursday and Friday, but I'll be available if you need me. Uh, I'll be checking in periodically, but our staff, of course, is there for you if you need us. We're working really hard uh, through the year in updates, uh, finishing up the Roth conversions. So um, if you need something, reach out. You, uh, you should have received some calendar invites, but if you're a client, you need to see us. We've designated um, time just for you folks on the calendar. So um, if you have questions about Roth conversions, let's get those done. Let's get the year in planning done so we can jump into 2023 uh, in the right place. Uh, it is... Uh, you know, really middle of November at this point, our soft deadline for Roth conversions is 12-1, so de December uh, 1st. Our hard deadline is December 15th, so we're kind of at the no more messing around <laughs> point of view or a period of time. Um, I shared with you, uh, you know, many of you were on the Heather Schreiber webinar and you've uh, received the recording of that. I, I hope you received the recording of that um, or had a chance to review it uh, if you're interested in it. And uh, I wanted to share with you again that we retained Heather as part of our firm uh, to help with Social Security planning questions. So I'm very excited about that. Heather is um, really the expert in social, social Security planning in the country and happy to have her as a resource for our clients. All right. Um, so let's talk about headlines this week. So um, a lot of talk, a lot, we were starting to hear a lot of talk about layoffs we always talk about, um, we've been talking about recession here in this group for a while. You know my feelings. I feel like when we look back on it, we've been in a recession since really um, the COVID hit. But um, now Facebook, the owner of Facebook is Meta, M-E-T-A. Uh, they're talking about large scale layoffs and we're just seeing that certainly in tech companies, but in other areas as well. Um, Wall Street Journal reports that China reports an unexpected drop in exports. Um, and uh, a lot of discussion about the Fed's rate hikes last week and how they're um, it's pulling money out of the out of the markets. Um, I've you know, I, I you folks know I'm a real estate investor. I have a relatively new property I bought last year and I just got a um, and we're, we're, we've got an interim kind of uh, structure on loan going on with that. And I just got a rate increase of another one half of one percent. Um, for that. So we've got to make a decision uh, on that. And people are facing that all over the place, buying new cars, buying new houses. Um, you know, it's it, we're starting to see the effect of these rate increases, not so much on inflation, but uh, certainly in the ability to borrow money. All right. Um, we talked uh, last week and over the past few weeks about the uh, increase of uh, for Social Security, 8.7%. I talked uh, a bit during the webinar with Heather about my concern about how that's going to shorten the time that the trust funds will be depleted. It's currently suggested or, or anticipated to be depleted, the trust fund for Social Security at 2034. My thought is with this increase, we're probably going to see that brought down a year or maybe more when we see the uh, trustees report next year. Uh, we talked about uh, the IRS increases for our um, contributions and, and um, our tax brackets uh, last week. So let's get into the slot uh, information. So I'm going to share my screen with you here. So bear with me. All right. So I'm hoping you can see uh, IRA transactions that can't be missed. Raise your hand if that's what you're seeing, because I'm not seeing my green outline. Excellent. Thank you very much. So um, I share this screen with you so you can follow along. There's a lot of information in these updates. This is written by Andy Ives um, from the slot group. And, and I really like this, um, this section here, or this report here, because it talks about transactions uh, that you can easily miss. And there's a couple on here I'll share with you as we go, but we see problems with this all the time. So let's go through it. Andy writes, not every IRA transaction is easily identifiable. Some require a little legwork 
to reveal or report what occurred. Some transactions are not even labeled on official IRS tax forms and can go undetected. Here are the three items that taxpayers and tax professionals alike can easily miss. And folks, this is on you. Record keeping is on you. We'll help in every way we can. We, we try to keep good records. Your tax preparer should help as well, but it fundamentally falls on you to keep records. The first is qualified charitable distributions or QCDs. They're not reported on 1099-Rs. So the QCDs are coming, becoming very, very popular because it's a way to redirect required minimum distributions directly to a charity, doesn't go into your bank account, can't go into your bank account first if it goes directly to a qualified charity. It's like it never happened uh, from a tax point of view. So people are really liking that. There are some limits. We're going to talk about those, but they're becoming very, very popular so when we go through our financial planning process and we identify that legacy longevity portion of, of your investments, and that's that legacy longevity means these are funds that you're uh, likely not to need during your lifetime. So it's either going to be there for, uh, you know, if you want to do something um, significant with it, big trip, big purchase, or uh, if you happen to live long, much longer than you think, or some kind of unexpected medical event, or this is the amount that you're likely to leave as a legacy. Well, some people say, you know what, I if, if that's the amount I'm likely not going to uh, need, I can start carving out these qualified charitable distributions and sending that uh, IRA money right to uh, the charity. Therefore, you never pay tax on it. But there are some limitations, and it requires your, your own record keeping. So IRA custodians, I'm right here. Where's my cursor? I'm right here. IRA custodians will not separately report a QCD. There's no code or box on the 1099-R to identify a QCD. It's up to the taxpayer to let the IRS know about the donation by including the information on the tax return. Since there is no 1099-R reporting code, tax preparers and CPAs must be alerted. QCDs can easily be missed on a tax return, resulting in an erroneous taxable IRA distribution. Uh, the lack of a QCD code on the 1099-R is intentional. This is not an oversight by the IRS and is most likely a welcome relief for custodians. Why? Because an IRA custodian does not have firsthand knowledge of whether a particular distribution meets all the conditions. Is it a qualifying charity? Did the person already max out the $100,000 QCD limit from another IRA at another firm? Custodians do not want to police any of these details. Remember, each person can... Um, distribute after your age 70 and a half, and that, that conflicts with the RMD age of 72. Understand that the IRS seems to like to keep things confusing. Uh, at, after age 70 and a half, and you must pass actually 70 and a half, it's not the year in which you turn 70 and a half, it's not that. If, you're, if, you reach, if your half birthday is in June, you can't do the QCD until after June. Each person can distribute $100,000 out of their IRA, IRAs or an IRA and send it directly to a charity. And it doesn't have to be all at once. You can do 10,000, 10 to 10 different charities. So you can see why a custodian doesn't want to chase that down. Number two, tracking Roth IRA contributions and Roth conversions. There is a form for this. IRS form 5498 contains a bevy of information, including a definite date for every Roth contribution and conversion. You should keep these. We had a person who had um, over contributed to their Roth IRA over many years. He's an excellent record keeper and he had the records for all these contributions and we were able to correct it with not much pain to him. Uh, and we couldn't have done that without the, um, with, with, now there was some expense, don't get me wrong. And there was a lot of work involved, but because he kept such ex excellent records, the road was much, much easier for him. Uh, box number three, of Roth conversions. Until a person is 59 and a half, every IRA conversion will carry its own five-year clock to determine whether distributions of the converted amounts are subject to the 10% early distribution penalty. It's all recorded on the annual 5498. A Roth conversion is essentially timestamped January 1 for the year listed on the form. Add five years and a Roth IRA owner will know exactly when those Roth conversion dollars are available pen penalty free. So since we mentioned the five-year rule, I'm just going to remind you that yes, the five-year rule gets confusing. It stacks up each conversion, each contribution has its own five-year rule, uh, five-year time clock when you're under 59 and a half. But once you're over 59 and a half, it becomes really, really simple. As long as you've had a single Roth IRA with a small amount of money, 
I want to say even a dollar in it, <laughs> you, uh, and it's more than five years old, you've met that time, um, time clock restriction, that five-year rule. So don't really worry about it if you're over 59 and a half. So now box number 10 on the 5498, that's our Roth IRA contributions. The first one was conversions. Roth con contributions are also time stamped on the 5498. Technically, there is no place on the 1040 to report a Roth contribution. So how does the IRS know when a person opened his first Roth IRA and set the five-year forever clock in motion for distributions of tax-free earnings? See form 5498. Excellent record keeping is important. Where can you keep these records? Each one of our clients has an e-money login with a vault. You can upload your tax records right into there. You can in your in your folder. There is some um, limitation on uh, memory usage, but I've that or you know whatever they call it data usage. Uh, but I've been using e-money now since 2010, uh, and uh, I've never ever hit it. Um, we also have another platform could advise on with a vault. So we can we can create uh, a tax vault in either one of these for you to use and you can upload this information. Number three, forgetting to file 8606 to claim basis for after-tax contributions. How do you tell the IRS an IRA distribution or Roth conversion is not taxable? This is a big deal, folks. There are plenty of people who come to us and say, you know, I've got some after-tax money in my IRA or in my 401k. I want to make sure if I'm converting that to a Roth IRA that it's not taxed again. Well, if you don't have your records, it's likely it's going to be taxed again. And that is not a good situation. Whether you whether it's taxed again, whether you do the conversion or whether it's taxed again at distribution, if you don't have your records, it's going to be taxed again. And tax, tax once is bad enough. Taxed again is horrible. Um, how do you tell the IRS that an IRA distribution of Roth conversion is not taxable? After all, the IRS will treat it as ordinary income unless there's evidence that it should not be taxed. The answer is IRS form 8606. IRA, IRA custodians do not keep track or after of after tax contributions. So that means the custodians are your fidelities of the world, Schwabs of the world, a Vanguard. They don't keep records of this. It's on you. Upload it to that vault. Um, even if you tell them that the funds are after tax or kept or keep the after tax dollars in a separate IRA, they do not keep track of it. Custodians have no way of knowing what a person claims on his tax return. So they have no way of knowing if a deduction for an IRA contribution was taken or not. Anytime, and I'm right here now, anytime an uh, after tax contribution is made to an IRA, IRS form 8606 must be filed. This is essentially the client waving a flag and declaring, I have after tax funds in my IRA. Without the form, the IRS will assume that any funds distributed from the IRA or converted to a Roth IRA are taxable. Be careful not to look, uh, overlook any of these all important items. Thank you, Andy. Now into the mailbag. So the mailbag is when folks write in questions and the Slack group answers them. This is by Ian Berger. Uh, the first question it has to do with RMDs, always questions about RMDs. I'm 72 years old and want to start taking RMDs. I'm 72 years old and have to start taking RMDs. Not want, you must. If you don't take RMDs, who wants to tell me what the penalty is if you don't take your RMD? Fill it out in the Q&A for me. I have multiple accounts from teaching jobs that I had many years ago, plus a couple of traditional IRAs and a 401k with my current employer. Can I total all these up as of December 31st, 2021 and take an RMD based on that number? Or does each account have an RMD based on its value? Really great question, John, because there's a lot of confusion around this. So let's see who got this right on the Q&A. Keith says 50%. Steve, Steve says 50%. Kathy says 50%. You're all right. The penalty for not taking an RMD is 50% of what you should have taken. So if your RMD is um, uh, $30,000, then your penalty would be $15,000. That's a big one. Thank you, everybody, for your um, participation in that. So John wants to know, can he total up all of his retirement accounts and take a distribution out of one? Now, remember, multiple accounts from teaching jobs. Uh, this means retirement accounts, 403Bs, 401Ks, et cetera. And then he said, plus a couple of traditional IRAs. So remember, while they kind of feel the same IRAs and retirement plans, the rules are completely different. You've got to pay attention to the differences in those rules. So let's, let's find out the answer here together. Dear John, 
The required minimum distribution rules for aggregate and retirement plans account are tricky. All of your traditional IRAs can be aggregated with each other, but not with your retirement plans, your 403Bs from your previous teaching jobs or your 401k. This means that RMDs for each IRA account must be calculated separately, but the total RMDs must may be taken from one or more IRA account. Now, remember, talking about IRAs. So just separate them in your mind. If, if John has, he didn't talk about differences, but let's say he has a million dollars in all of his retirement accounts, his 403B, his 401K. He's got a million dollars in his IRAs. He can, and let's say there's just two IRAs. He can calculate those two IRAs together. And it doesn't matter if there's two or 10 IRAs. He can calculate those together and take a distribution, his RMD, out of just one out of the, R, of the IRA. Out of the 401ks and 403bs and retirement plans, he has to calculate them separately and he has to take them separately out of those plans. And there's another nuance here that um, Ian's going to talk about. Um, so the IRAs can be aggregated with each other, but not with your 403Bs from your previous teaching job or your 401k. This means that the iron, uh, okay, we talked about that. Your multiple 403B accounts can also be aggregated with each other, but not with your IRAs or 401ks. If your 401k plan uses the still working exception, you do not have to take the RMDs from the plan until you retire. At that point, the RMD for your 401k must be calculated separately and taken apart from your IRAs and 403Bs. Okay, so I'm sorry, I made a mistake there. The 403Bs do have a rule that they can be, see, this is the difference between retirement plans and IRAs, that they can be aggregated, but the 401k has to be separate. Um, so I, I said that incorrectly. Considering all these moving parts, it must be wise to consider consolidation to minimize future RMD hassles. Now, uh, I think John said that he's still working. If he's still working, that one retirement plan that he's still working in, he does not, if he's not more than a 5% owner, owner of the company, he doesn't have to take distributions from there. So one of the answers might be that he could roll over the other plans into his existing plan um, if they allow for it. I have a question or a roll the four or three B's or the, the plans that he's, he's, he's not contributing to over to an IRA just to make things simpler for. Him. I have a client that owns a business in his IRA. When he turns age 72, how is this RMD calculated? Does he need to value appraise the business each December to determine the next year's RMD amount? Thanks. Well, this is what's hard about these self-directed IRAs where you own properties or a business or something like that. It does have to be valued and then you have to take a distribution out of that IRA. So how is that done? Maybe, maybe they're rental properties and there may not be enough cash available to take a distribution. So Ian writes, yes, he must obtain an annual appraisal of the business to determine each year's required minimum distribution. The business must be appraised annually in order for the IRA custodian to report it to the IRS each year on 5498, form 5498. The appraisal must be independent and legitimate so it can withhold scrutiny from the IRS if challenged. Folks, that's a big deal and something that, you know, I see these ads on TV about owning your business, owning properties and IRAs. All that, of course, can be done. You just have to be careful that you're prepared for the details. A really good example is even if you owned a, a rental property, as an example, in your IRA and you need a new roof, and let's say the roof costs $10,000. Well, if you don't have the cash available or, or the funds available, whether you're going to borrow on the property or not, um, to pay for that roof, how are you going to pay for it? Well, some people might say, well, I'm just going to pay for it out of my checking account. We, well, the problem is that's a prohibited transaction. I, I, well, actually, that would be a, a, an over contribution um, into that IRA, and you couldn't do that. So that's just really one easy example of why these are more challenging. All right, I'm going to stop my share there and we're going to continue on. Um, actually, I'm going to share again. So I, I wanted to talk, we hear a lot. I don't know how, you know, people pay a different, uh, pay attention on different levels. So some folks, um, they really don't pay much attention to the markets. Some folks do, but a lot of uh, discussion right now and certainly over the past several months has been talking about this inverted yield curve. So I like the graph on, on here that Invesco shares. I see a question. I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, and I just wanted to share this with you. So this is one of my favorite um, pieces that I get usually on Monday mornings. And it just gives a snapshot of the previous week. So this is, you can see here, market review at a glance, week ended uh, for November, 2022. So obviously that was Friday. And it gives you the returns for the week over here of the different stock markets. 
Dow Jones Industrial Average. You know, we, we went through what these indice, indices mean several weeks ago, and you can look at that video if you'd like. The S&P 500, the NASDAQ, um, the MSCI world, uh, not including the U.S., emerging markets. So you can see that it was a bit mixed last week. The U.S. markets were down. Uh, the global markets were up, um, you know, with the exception here of these. But um, we're still down for the year. So the Dow Jones Industrial Average is, is down 9.33%. The S&P 500 is still down over, almost 20 the NASDAQ is down almost, um, well, just call it 32 and a half percent. A lot of, lot of loss here in the markets, you know, the stock markets. This is what's surprising, and you've heard me say this several times, to most people are these drops in the bond market. So you've heard me say that this Barclays Aggregate Bond Index probably represents mo where most people hold their bond money in IRA accounts, retirement accounts, traditional investment accounts. That just tends to be where most people hold it. Um, and that is down 16% for the year. Now, most people aren't, aren't ready for that. They think that they're buying bonds to offset the risk of stock. And you'll see that Dow Jones Industrial Average is down 9%, 9.33%, but your bond holdings are down 16%. That doesn't seem right, right? But that's, that's what happens in a rising interest rate environment. And this is where we are. Even in the short-term bonds, one to three years, we're down almost 5%. So um, uh, this is what concerns a lot of people. And you can see here how rapidly, now I'm in the center here, if you can see my cursor, you can see how rapidly rates are increasing. So let's look at the two-year treasury. So this is a, a bond issued by, or a note issued by the, um, the US government and it matures in two years. That's what that means. It's, uh, it's coupon or it's yield that you're getting, the interest that you're getting is 4.66%. One year ago, it was 0.42%. So that's a really fast right, rise. But you'll see here the 10-year treasury. So if you hold that same issue, the issue from the federal government for 10 years, you get one half of a percent less. And that's what they're talking about, about the inversion of the yield curve. So here is kind of a normal looking yield curve. I'm looking at the top of the screen here on the right-hand side. And you can see for the amount of time that you hold a bond, you get more interest. Well, what's happening here, this is, so this is as of 11-4-2021, that's normal. What's happening as of 10-4 and 11-4-2022, that shows uh, the two months comparisons there, uh, that yield curve is inverting. So you get more interest for the shorter period of time as opposed to holding onto it later. That's one of what we call a leading indicator of uh, recession. So everybody seems to be in agreement that next year is going to look pretty rough from a, a recession point of view. All right, let me close this before I forget. And I do, let me just see what the question is. Walter asks if the business, so going back to um, the um, self-directed IRAs and the property, uh, Walter asks, if the business was owned in a Roth IRA, would that eliminate the need for an annual appraisal? Well, it, I, I'm going to say I think so, because there's no required minimum distribution on a Roth IRA. Uh, you still have the issues, though, Walter, with maintenance. So if your um, property is generating enough income where you can uh, set aside some money to, um, to update things, you know, paint the place, um, put a new roof on, heater, whatever you have to do. Um, then it may work. But if you have to contribute anything, um, it's got to fall within the guidelines of contributing to a Roth IRA in that point, because any, any kind of funding coming into the Roth um, for ownership of that property or business would have to be, um, have to follow the, the rules. You've got to, you know, you've got to have earned income um, and rental income doesn't count. You got to have earned income uh, and you have to be able to make those contributions. So not too much income, but you have to have earned income. Good question, though. Thank you, Walter. All right. Um, all right. So uh, UBS uh, reported that they see a 16% drop expected by mid 2023 as the U.S. sinks into recession. So they're saying, uh, you know, we've had a, a good run yesterday. Markets were up before I started talking this morning. Um, 
And I think we even closed Friday up a bit, uh, a couple hundred points in, um, I think, the Dow at least. But uh, UBS is saying, you haven't seen anything yet. We expect another 16% drop by mid-2023. Um, and they give a lot of reasons for that. UBS predicted on Monday that Wall Street would suffer a renewed sell-off headed into the middle of 2023 with a level of 3,200 in the S&P 500. Um, and, uh, and they said the setup for 2023 is essentially a race between easing inflation and financial conditions versus the coming uh, hit to growth and earnings. So they're expecting it to get worse. Many people are, you know my feeling, I think it's gonna be a really tough slog for the next year, year and a half, three years, I hope it's not five years. So we've been gearing up for that over the past year. And uh, I'm pretty happy with where things are sitting and where we're heading from an investment point of view. Uh, we review the plans and we're, we're stress testing our plans and most are remaining successful, but some are dropping off and we've got to be ahead of that. Uh, BlackRock reports that stocks slid and yields rose as Federal Reserve delivered another mega rate rate rise uh, and signaled it would need to take rates even higher than originally planned. Uh, we're going to see inflation this week on Thursday. Uh, I think the, the uh, ECB re reported 10.7 a uh, week ago. I hope it's not that high, um, but I think we're going to probably see it in the eights again, um, a little higher than most people are accept, uh, expecting. And Prudential has a new format that I'm trying to get used to, um, but uh, they had some really interesting ex excerpts from the Fed meeting. And one of them that I pulled out is uh, the uh, Fed chairman said, there is no pattern to suggest inflation has come down and the terminal rate will probably be higher. So the Fed Chairman is saying we're likely to see higher inflation, higher than we thought it would be in September. So um, that's concerning, of course, right? These, these are the, the Fed chairs are the people um, really pulling the level levers on in, uh, interest rates. And, and remember, a lot of people like to compare, okay, where have we been before and how does it compare to 2022, 23, and looking forward. And some people talk about the 70s, some people talk about the 60s, some people talk about the Great Recession. Um, you know, the, so all those things are good to look at, because, you know, we have rising interest rates, and certainly rising interest rates and higher inflation in the 70s. What's different this time? Well, this time we have millions of people retiring uh, in, from the baby boomer generation, right? There's 70 plus million people in that generation, and, and in your generation, for most of you, and you know, there's just thousands retiring every day. And that is something we have never seen before. So I really don't know if that's going to be a positive or a negative. It might work out that, hey, because of this change in uh, job availability or, um, you know, what have you, it might end up being a positive thing. But what worries me is we've got millions of people now claiming Social Security. We have millions of people now on Medicare, additional people. Um, and we've got to, and these things are already underfunded, terribly underfunded. I talked about the underfunding of um, Social Security at the beginning of the webinar, and I'll just remind you what the date is for Medicare. Um, Medicare trust runs out of money in 2028. Remember, Social Security is 2034. Medicare is 2028. So 2028 is right around the corner. Uh, and I expect that'll probably be uh, shortened when we see the next custo um, trustees report. But um, so we're not sure, we don't know, but we've got to be uh, defensively optimistic. So our defensive posture from an investment point of view has worked well this year. Uh, we can't stay uh, in this place and we're starting to unwind out of it, but um, we want to be optimistic. Uh, we have good reason to be optimistic, but we have to be defensively optimistic. So, you know, first of all, we have to make sure your plan is in place. Uh, second, we want to make sure your plan is properly funded for the short term. Um, and then, um, uh, and, and we have to continue to invest out for growth as we continue, because while I don't think we're going to be in the 8%, 6% of inflation going forward, even if we hover around three and a half, four percent 4% for some time, you can't just sit in CDs, treasury bonds, uh, you, you've got to take some risk and have some growth. Okay, so now let's talk about our financial planning topic. Let me close my notes down and I'll share my screen yet again. Okay, so raise your hand for me if you can see uh, financial planning topic, why are beneficiary designations so important? 
Thank you. So, so some people just um, go jump into this section on YouTube. So if you're just joining us on YouTube, please hit the subscribe, like, and notification button. But um, we want to talk about beneficiary designation. So I'm going to draw on this board so you're going to see me looking down. Um, you know, you all, many of you know my story. Uh, there's, there's a lot of reasons why beneficiary designations are important, but my oldest sister passed away of ovarian cancer um, about 15 years ago now. And if you're, if you've attended my classes, you've heard this story, but I talked to her before she passed away about, you know, could I help her with anything, estate planning, anything. Now there was no surprise. She knew she was going to pass away, but she told me everything was taken care of. And shortly thereafter, after she passed my mother, who was 80 and changed at the time, um, got a phone call that she was the beneficiary of my sister's only retirement plan. She worked for the same company for, uh, from the time she was 16 to the day she died in her mid fifties. And um, it caused a lot of family turmoil. Let's just put it that way. And it's completely unnecessary because um, you should review these plans on a regular basis and it should be at least once a year. So why are beneficiary designations so important? Let's first talk about what is a beneficiary designation. Well, there are certain um, contracts and, and investment types and documents that allow you to name a beneficiary, and that is you're listing who your funds want to go to. And I'm going to I'm going to just put a note here contingent. Um, so primary. I know that's hard to read. Uh, I thought this note situation was better now with this new. Uh, pad, but so um, it's when you note who or write down, designate in formally in on a document where you want your funds to go. And you all know this. You can say, you know, Joe gets fifty uh, percent, and Jane gets fifty percent, and you can. You know, and if you have a million dollars, then uh, Joe gets five hundred thousand, and Jane gets five hundred thousand dollars. Really, really simple. So you can just change it whenever you want, but name your your people who they're going to go to, and you can also name a charity. It could be charity, right? Um, there could be a charity as a beneficiary. So you could do a third, a third, a third, or you could you could do it however you want to. You can also so in this case, we're talking about a primary, a primary, and a primary. Now you could say. All right, well, I wanted to go to, to Jane and Joe, but if Jane passes, if one of them passes away, we're going to name this charity as contingent, and then their portion is going to go to the charity. If they both pass away, then the, they both go to charity. Or you can name individuals as contingents. You can, you can name a trust as a con contingent. You can name a trust as a primary. You can name almost whomever you want. Can't really name minors. Right. So you've got to be mindful of that. You'd want to name a trust for the minor, but you want to have this conversation with your estate attorney uh, or your uh, financial planner. But it's important to name somebody. And you have this ability in retirement plans for sure, IRAs, traditional and Roth. You can name your beneficiaries. Any life insurance policies, you can name beneficiaries. And any annuities allow you to name beneficiaries. If you don't name beneficiaries, what happens? So no beneficiary, we'll come back to this one. No beneficiary designation, it goes to probate. So instead of going to John and Jane directly, and that usually happens within 30 days, let's just say, it goes to court. Now, I don't know about where you live, but right now it's about it's gotten a little worse, but it's about 18 months to go through the probate process. You know all the reasons why, why you want, might want to avoid probate. It takes a long time. It's public. Uh, somebody who you don't know may be making the decision for you, but um, uh, it, and it takes time and it also costs money. Whereas if you name your beneficiary designation, it goes directly to that person. Another thing is eligible designated beneficiaries can still stretch. We talk about with the SECURE Act, the death of the, the stretch IRA, the stretch IRA allows you to take uh, distrib um, uh, di uh, distributions each year. So you minimize the amount of tax that you have to pay immediately um, or, you know, it gets you out of that 10 year rule. 
Um, but with a stretch IRA, you can take it over your lifetime, right? So if you're an eligible designated beneficiary, now remember uh, who those eligible de de designated beneficiaries are, surviving spouses. Now, surviving spouses, I don't know why it's not letting me write in there, but you can see it. Surviving spouses have their own rules. They can treat an IRA as their own, roll it into their own IRA, or have it as an inherited IRA, still do a stretch IRA if that makes sense to them. Minor children of the account owner. So a minor child, if they're able to do the stretch IRA, they're able to, think about it, they could take it over their lifetime. They can make that last uh, a long period of time and potentially get a lot more into that IRA. Disabled individuals, the chronically ill and beneficiaries not more than 10 years younger than the IRA owner. Everybody else has different rules. Those rules are complex now, as we've talked about many times, you know, the funds had to be distributed by the 10th year, the year following the death, unless the, the uh, person who um, uh, passed away, who the original IRA account owner had already begun their required minimum distributions, then Distribu required minimum distributions also have to continue during that time, and it has to be distributed by 10 years. But if you're an eligible de designated beneficiaries uh, beneficiary, you can you can still do a stretch IRA. So without um, naming a beneficiary, though, that doesn't happen. If you don't name that eligible designated beneficiary, that stretch option is gone. You want, of course, name the people, uh, person, organization that you want to receive your money. Don't leave it to probate. Don't leave it to um, somebody else's decision. And even if it goes as per my last will, why? I've, I see that still sometimes where people come in and they say, well, my, my attorney said just to name it as per my last will. Well, that goes to probate. That costs money and takes time. And the, the, it's just why when you can, because they might say, well, because I have five different uh, beneficiaries of my will and a trust, that's fine. Just list them, list them on your documents um, much faster, much easier. And you can change it every year. You change it as much as you want, not, not even just every year. The other thing you got to be aware of with beneficiaries, and this is why you should review them every year, is beneficiaries win a vast amount of the time. If, for instance, I am named beneficiaries of your retirement plans or annuities, life insurance, anything that's available to be named as beneficiary, and somebody else is named in your will, I'm going to get your money. So you don't, you, you folks don't want to leave your money to me, right? So, of course, I'm joking about this, but if you name somebody as beneficiary, just like what happened to my mother, my mother, you know, Sarah, her name was, uh, she was the beneficiary of my. Um, uh, my sister's 401k. Her husband, his name was Chick, or is Chick. Um, I'm sure she wanted Chick to be the beneficiary of the 401k, but it was never changed. So the the will was changed, but it, what would have happened is, you know, he he could have received some of it, but my mother would have received the rest of it. So the what she did was she disclaimed it, and it went right to him. But uh, he has he had less options at that point. He could have if it was, you know, if it was structured differently, um, naming children things like that, it would have been much better. But I'll get off of that soapbox. Um, but the beneficiary does if 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 it goes to court, it's likely that the beneficiaries are going to win highly, highly likely in the in the high nineties that that beneficiary designation is going to win over a. Um, a will, right? Many, many people think that, well, it says this in my will. So even if I don't have a, a beneficiary designation, well, I'm sorry, that would carry to the will. But even if I, I you know, I have my ex-husband or my ex-spouse, the will's going to beat that out. No. And the ex-spouse is a really good example. Because that, that falls to each individual state. Um, all right. The last thing I'll say about beneficiaries is it's not just these things that you can act. Whoop. What happened there? Hold on. Now my EDB came over. Okay, um, these things technically uh, have beneficiary designations, but we have other things available to us depending on where you live that act like beneficiary designations. And that's TOD, that's transfer on death. These are usually investment accounts, you know, brokerage accounts or investments. And POD, 
These are bank accounts. You can set these up and name really beneficiary type designations on these documents. Be careful, you don't wanna overdo it. You wanna make sure that you've got some uh, funds in your estate to pay bills and expenses, but these work the same way when it comes to it. Just like beneficiary designations, you name the individuals, you know, individual A, B, and C, and these funds go directly to them after they're notified of you passing, just like beneficiary designations. TODs are really simple. Most investment firms are up to speed on these. PODs are a real pain in the neck because you're going to go to the representative of the bank and you're going to say, I want to add a POD or a payable on death uh, designation to my account. And they may say something like, oh, we used to do those. I don't think we do them anymore. Or I'm not sure how to do that. So you might, uh, it might take you some time, but I don't know any institution, any bank that doesn't offer it. Okay, that is a brief overview of beneficiary designations and why they're important. You don't, if you it, avoid it going to probate, probate's not the worst thing in the world, but it's unnecessary for things that are able to pass via beneficiary designation. Just identify who you want it to go to and how you want it to go. So what percentage, what amount, you know, who, very, very simple. And you should review it how often. Folks, you should review it every single year. We review it with our financial planning process every single year. We have a checklist. We write it down. We review it with the client. We make sure that it's right. We see people make changes all the time or think something's omitted. They, they say, oh, I didn't, I didn't think it was that way. It, it's so, you know, even people we've worked with for years, they'll look at it and say, oh, you know what? Yeah, I, I, don't, want, I don't want it that way anymore. Or I thought it was a different way. So let's make it this way. Uh, it's vitally, vitally important. So review it every single year, have it part of your process, upload it into your vault, make sure you have it, make sure you understand it um, and stay on top of it. All right, we have a question as we're heading out. Let me find my cursor. PODs are not needed for joint bank accounts. Some, well, Doug, uh, it depends. A joint, so a joint bank account is gonna go to the person you have the joint account with. Um, some, some accounts, uh, will allow for a POD on a joint account. I don't know of many, but what you'd want to do is when you become that one individual uh, who owns the joint account, and that's usually when you're talking about spouses, um, there are considerations to take into account for adding a non-spouse to your account as a, as a joint holder, um, such as tax, liability, et cetera. But when you're talking about spouses, for example, if you and your wife are a joint account and you pass away and now your wife is the only account owner, she would automatically you know, be able to take over that account, uh, depending on how it's jointly structured. Uh, then your wife could name payable and death designations, right? Uh, POD designations. So good point. All right, folks, uh, that's it for today. We went over the slot updates. We went over some market updates. We talked about the importance of beneficiary designations. I hope you learned something today. I look forward to seeing you next week. Yes, we will have um, our webinar next week. And I guess, I guess for the rest of November, even though it's Thanksgiving, that all happens at the end of the last week. Um, have a great week. If you need anything, reach out to us. Please take a couple minutes to answer the survey. I'd appreciate it. And take care of yourself. Bye-bye.